good morning, everyone, and uh, Paul, thanks very much for inviting me here. Um, uh, I, I uh, sort of, um, uh, it's almost an oxymoron saying that uh, academic orthopedic surgeon, but thank you very much. Um, uh, so I, what I wanted to do today was perhaps give you a little bit of an overview of, of the, the center I work in, but also some, one of the major research themes that we have been pursuing in Oxford now for the past five years, which is looking at femoral acetabular impingement. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, but many of you also are general surgeons and um, sports physicians, and it may be that um, some of this is new to you and therefore of interest. So I come from um, the Institute of Musculoskeletal Sciences in Oxford, and um, we have over 300 scientists. We have um, actually some of that, uh, we have about a, about a 75 million pound grant income every year. That's a, a bit out of date now. We're, we're a major uh, biomedical research unit themed for musculoskeletal disease. Um, and our focus at the moment is looking at preventative um, strategies for musculoskeletal disease, trialing new treatments, particularly interventional treatments like surgery, and looking at also mechanistic areas. And we have a whole group of scientists doing various things from basic science in the labs to animal studies through to multinational uh, randomized control trials. Um, one area that I've been leading on is um, uh, uh, looking at this area of femoral acetabular impingement, but also looking at surrogate imaging markers for osteoarthritis. So that's using new technologies like MRI um, uh, and various other mo modalities um, to try and detect arthritis at an earlier stage so that we can act at an earlier stage. So today I was just going to talk to you a bit about uh, FAI, what it is. Um, its pathogenesis, how it links to arthritis and the research we've done in Oxford, but how that links to uh, other areas around the world, um, particularly Europe and the North America, in terms of the evidence. And then talk a bit about the treatment and our experiences with that, um, some ongoing trials and then some novel imaging stuff that we can apply to this area to make our treatments and interventions a bit better. So when we talk about femoroacetabular impingement, um, we, it's worth looking back at the literature um, to history and, you know, if you asked a surgeon 20 years ago or any physician what the cause of osteoarthritis was, most would say, well, it's idiopathic, which basically means no one knows what the cause is. Um, but increasingly over the years, it became evident that a lot of patients with arthritis had some very subtle abnormalities of their hip that may have been missed in the past or just thought to be normal variants, uh, but may indeed be associated with arthritis. And it's really um, from that that the investigations into this area began. Now, with regard to FAI, we um, know that um, people were describing um, bony abnormalities of the proximal femur since the 1940s. In fact, there are references going back 200 years to cam deformities and these, these sort of pistol grip deformities that some people would see on, on, uh, on cadaveric specimens and on x-ray. Um, it wasn't until the 70s that labral tears of the hip were actually described um, in any detail. Um, so this is a relatively new condition when you compare it to osteoarthritis and the descriptions of that itself. So what is femoral acetabular impingement? Least of all, it's difficult to say, so we call it FAI. Um, uh, and it, it is, in fact... A, thought to be a mechanical condition of the hip resulting from a subtle abnormality in morphology. And so the theory is, and in fact the evidence now supports this, is that you get impact from a deformity in flexion. It damages the labrum of the hip to begin with, which is cartilage that runs around the rim of the joint, resulting in cartilage delamination within the joint and therefore a process um, that begins the process of osteoarthritis. And so we can look at cadaveric specimens. There are mechanistic studies that have demonstrated this. Um, and actually, we know now it produces a pretty reliable diagnos um, diagnostic sort of uh, or uh, clinical s syndrome uh, whereby patients will get groin pain, intermittent initially, it builds up to more constant pain the longer it goes on. And then occasionally, uh, and, and now increasingly, we're seeing back pain uh, and uh, joint and pain elsewhere being a part of this syndrome. Um, we, there are reproducible tests to look at it, and there are reproducible imaging um, with regard to, which I'll talk a bit about later on. Here is an example of CAM-type FAI. You can see 
Uh, here we have a lateral bump on both the hips. These are very marked, what we call pistol grip deformities. And when we draw a circle around the hip to sort of define where we would very much like the centre of rotation to be, we can see that a large prominence sticks out laterally. There's another type of FAI called pincer, which is because the socket is deep, but results in the same problem, where the hip impinges one piece of bone on the other because um, of overcoverage rather than a bump. So you can see here the socket's very deep, and our, there's a very narrow piece of bone in between the pelvis and the hip. So what about the pathogenesis? Well, we believe that... Um, uh, we, we, there is, oh, sorry, that was meant to work. It's decided not to, but um, you can see here that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deformity around the front of the hip, and uh, as the hip flexes up, you get impingement of the uh, labrum initially, which then, once that gives way, the, allows the bump to enter the joint and cause cartilage damage. Um, and what you find at hip arthroscopy, this is a, a greatly magnified view, is that you have a labral tear, which is this over here, we're looking at the labrum of the hip. You have a, uh, the femoral head here on the right-hand side, and here's the cartilage socket. But initially you get this picture with an area of uh, erythema and inflammation at the free edge of the labrum, which then results in uh, a, a quite marked uh, delamination of the cartilage uh, at the chondrolabral junction. And indeed, we do see a cascade of, um, of pathology developing over um, many years. On the top left-hand side here, we see early pathology, which we call a carpet lesion or a bubble lesion. You can see that this piece of cartilage here is mobile and has a sort of uh, a space behind it and deforms. This part here is still stuck on. Later on, we'll see full flaps developing, which get worse over time and eventually result in full thickness arthritis. And you see of these, this complete spectrum of disorders in patients presenting indeed at the time of surgery. This is not a bad place to be, and people, people with this picture seem to have a good result. Down here, the, uh, the more advanced the disease, the more unpredictable the result of any treatment. And in fact, uh, these people here are in quite a difficult situation. So what about the epidemiology of this? So we've identified a bump how does that actually relate to your future risk of arthritis? Well, there have been a number of cross-sectional studies looking at the um, association uh, or uh, the prevalence of this deformity initially. So we know that uh, in the population in general, um, uh, CAM deformities are present in up to a quarter of the population. Uh, the pincer deformities are probably variably reported, and therefore you could take a figure anywhere between five and 20, 25 percent. In fact, some people claim that they are present in a mixed form where you get a bit of cam, a bit of pincer in, in much higher numbers than that. But if you take a figure of around a quarter of all patients or people within the population having some form of hip, subtle hip deformity, that is about the right figure from the cross-sectional studies we have to date. This is a, a scatter plot of the Chingford cohorts uh, in the UK, and it shows that about 50% of um, the people who have a problem on one side will have a problem on the other as well. So it's not un uncommon to have bilateral problems. So what is about its distribution? Well, when we first looked at this, and, and this is relatively new data over the past three or four years, this condition seems to be a, a separate entity. So this is a bimodal plot showing the distribution of alpha angle on the, on the x-axis, which demonstrates um, that, indeed, we've got a separate population of people here who are distinct from the normal population who have a bump. So this is not a, an, os an osteophyte or a separate um, uh, sort of part of a continuum of deformity. It's a distinct population, as you can see on the right-hand side there. And it would seem that an alpha angle of about 65 is where the cutoff between normal and abnormal lie, as far as epidemiological terms are, uh, are. So does the CAM evolve over time? So when we first started looking at this, people said, well, this is an osteophyte, so it, 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 it just happens to be there. So, you know, the, the longer someone um, lives, then the more likely they are to get an osteophyte, and this bump will start growing out the side of the hip. Well, if you look at, um, this is, the, again, Chingford cohort data. This is 1,000 people over 20 years that we looked at um, using hip x-rays. You can see that um, the distribution of the data at year two and eight are pretty much identical, um, and we've repeated that since for year 20. And you, there is no change in the distribution and the number of people with alpha angles over a 20-year period. 
And so we can say that this condition doesn't change over time if you, in terms of its morphology, although you do get osteoarthritis. And so we and other groups have looked at the longitudinal association of this condition with osteoarthritis. And this, again, is data from our own cohort um, in the UK, known as the Chingford cohort, and it's the only cohort at the time when we did this a few years ago um, that could answer this question. And what we looked at was the probability of a, uh, of a certain alpha angle at baseline giving you arthritis and resulting in hip replacement and pain um, 20 years or 19 years down the line. And if you look at the x-axis here, um, you remember that uh, histogram earlier with a cutoff of about 65, which is where we would regard an abnormal alpha angle starting. You can see that there's an exponential rise thereafter of um, uh, it risk or probability of osteoarthritis over 20 years. So on the, on the x-axis, you've got the baseline alpha angle. On the y-axis, you've got probability of developing arthritis 20 years down the line. So this condition is strongly associated in asymptomatic patients with future hip replacement and osteoarthritis. And that's highly significant. We looked at the measures of um, uh, DDH and pincer deformity, which are measured by the same um, uh, angle, which is called the lateral center end angle. And although this approach is significant, it appears that pincer deformities don't necessarily cause um, uh, uh, arthritis, uh, certainly statistically in the normal population, although there's other strong circumstantial evidence to support this. Dysplasia on the left-hand side obviously does. So what can we say from all this? Well, from our own work, we can say that alpha angle is bimodally distributed. Therefore, it's a re it suggests that FAI is a separate condition. It is a, a distinct pathology. It doesn't progress over time, um, and that with um, every sort of degree or so increase of alpha angle, you have a, a significant increase in your risk of osteoarthritis. From our own studies initially, these were looking at women, but subsequent studies have looked in both sexes and found that that risk is repeated. So that's in population studies, so that's in asymptomatic patients. When we look at symptomatic patients with this condition, the the risk of progression becomes even higher. So this is data from the Czech cohort, uh, which demonstrates essentially that if you have patients presenting at baseline, so in your clinic with pain, and an alpha angle of more than 85, which is quite a large bump, then they've got a very high chance of progressing to arthritis over five years. And that's from uh, data from uh, uh, Rotterdam, uh, and uh, interestingly, um, you know, demonstrates the high risk of progression um, in a relatively short period of time. Now, we did some work combining our cohorts with the Rotterdam cohort to, to use big data to give us some estimates as to what um, measures should indicate to us as doctors that patients are at risk. And what we found was that if we combine the cohorts, then your cutoff for alpha angle as being normal versus abnormal is about 60 degrees. And one, an alpha angle that is pretty certain to produce a, a degree of arthritis or degeneration in the future as, um, in terms of risk, there should be about 78 degrees. So we've now got a cutoff for what is regarded as FAI, but also we've got a cutoff which shows which patients with FAI are actually at higher risk. So what about FAI in sports people? We've demonstrated that it's prevalent in the population. We've demonstrated its link to arthritis in both asymptomatic and symptomatic people. What about in sports people? Well, in fact, the problem in sports people seems magnified. Although there's relatively limited evidence at the moment, and it's pretty limited to smaller cohort studies, we found that over the past couple of years, it suggests that in some sports you have about three and a half times prevalence in the population compared to general population. And you can see on the right hand side here you've got um, footballers, about 80 to 90 percent of footballers seem to have a cam deformity. NFL players it's slightly higher, ice hockey players seem to be quite high. There's some evidence coming from rowing now and the skiing seems to be lower. But every year there seems to be another sport that people find this um, deformity in. This is significant, really, because in the UK, a lot of people, particularly everywhere, elsewhere around the world, play, um, play sport. And these, these are the figures for football. Um, uh, about a fifth of the population will play sport, football at some point um, uh, during the past week. And therefore, you can imagine that, and certainly in children, 
the, 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 the exposed population is relatively high. So that brings me on to the fourth question that we came up with. And this is a sort of a process that kind of gone from identifying the problem initially and understanding it to understanding how it develops. And so we asked ourselves the question of how this condition develops. And, and uh, to do that, we've, been, we've set up a study called the femoral acetabular impingement uh, study in, in footballers. And what we did was a, um, a two-phase study looking at a prospective cohort of sports people versus normal controls uh, to initially cross-sectionally image them at baseline. And that was to look at a range of ages from 8 to 16 um, 110 academy level football players from this was mainly from Southampton Football Academy and 110 controls from school children um, so in other words high activity um, uh, academy players versus lower activity school controls and we looked at the prevalence of this condition and its development uh, in different age groups and although this is very early data and this in fact is is a, a study really that links very nicely to um, the Doha study that Paul is currently setting up uh, but our initial results from this, and we did various m morphological MRIs as well as T2 mapping MRIs, um, have demonstrated really that we see an injury in this condition at some point during development uh, in what we call the zone of Ranvier, which is just uh, around the proximal femoral physis about this area here. And um, over time, what we see is that this area tends to thicken and become enlarged. We don't quite know the mechanism of that yet, but it may be something to do with the physiological load that certain sports place on that zone during, at a critical time during maturation. And so what we've, what we've done so far, and this is relatively early data again, looking just at the footballers is trying to figure out, well, when does this deformity develop? Now, if you look at the bony deformity and, and apply a, 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 a red line where you would expect above which FAI is present, below which it is not present, you can see that at about 13 years old, you, you start to see the bony deformity develop in, in boys. If you look at the cartilage abnormality, consistent with this in the growing epiphysis, well, it, it, it happens much earlier. And in fact, you can see some kids at 9 or 10 years old developing this bump in cartilage form. So it would seem that this is an acquired deformity that occurs quite early on but then solidifies into a bony abnormality as the growth ceases. So it gives us, therefore, a target for which to think about how we might modify our sporting training, uh, how we might target screening. Uh, and, of course, this is an early stage, so it is still an evolution as to how we do this. And this just gives you another visual um, cue of when these kids start to develop their um, deformity. And you can see that it seems that most of the cartilage deformities in blue here begin to develop at about the age of 11, somewhere between 10 and 11. And then we don't see the bony deformities developing in, in kids until about 13, 14. So that's pretty much what we know so far about this condition. The course, the great thing about being a surgeon is that you can treat a condition before you really understand it. And um, uh, I mean, that's slightly facetious, but um, it is unfortunately, uh, and actually in many ways has been in the past to the benefit of, of medicine, that surgeons will go out and try new treatments based on their own understanding of pathology. And indeed, that's what has happened with, with FAI. Now, physios, and various other non-operative people who treat this condition non-operatively have understood it for a long time. And it seems the evidence today, although it's pretty scant, uh, suggests that these non-operative treatments can at least slow the progress of pain and in some patients can reverse the symptoms. So there's a good evidence base now building up um, over, that has built up over the past couple of years that demonstrates that physio and non-operative therapies are good at um, preventing pain in FAI, rehabbing patients, getting them back to sports. They're also good at preventing um, surgery and progression to surgery. There are some negative predictors, however. With this condition, if you have pain for more than 12 months, in other words, your non-operative treatments aren't working, if you're older or if you have a degree of arthritis, then it, you, not surprisingly, you're unlikely to do well with non-surgical treatment. And in fact, I suspect if you have a degree of arthritis, you're unlikely to do well with surgical treatment, particularly if it's arthroscopy. Uh, 
So what do we do surgically? Well, we um, repair the damage. So uh, one of the options we have is hip arthroscopy. And this is a picture of a hip arthroscopy. And here we can see uh, the labrum being repaired, very much as you would repair it in the shoulder, I suspect. Um, uh, you drill holes above the acetabulum and attach anchors and then repair the, the, the labrum back onto the rim of the socket. If you're lucky in this patient, there is no significant arthritis and that is 50% of the procedure done. The other 50% is uh, where we go outside the hip joint. So the hip here is relocated inside the socket where we saw the labral repair earlier. And you can see there's a, there's a cam uh, which, is, which is a bump, sorry, I'll put it there. You can see a bump right at the front of the hip joint here. And as the hip goes up, it puts pressure on the repair and it means we need to remove it. And the way we do that is to use a burr to remove what looks like a very large piece of bone. Of course, you've got to remember this is magnified quite significantly. And the problem with this sort of surgery is we don't actually, um, you know, treat, uh, we tend to under-treat the condition rather than over-treat it. This can be done open and was done open in the old days, but is now much more straightforward and probably safer to do arthroscopically. In some patients, we find chondral damage. So we find early osteoarthritis or even advanced arthritis, as you saw in those earlier um, videos um, of, of, of the progression of disease. And this is the biggest problem for us as surgeons because we don't have a good um, treatment for this as yet. There have been a lot of work done on ACI and the knee, there's much less than on ACI and the hip. Matrices, there's, again, there's very little in the hip. And the challenge with the hip is getting all these new technologies to stick when you get in the joint and, and to stay in place as the patient rehabs. We do use microfracture, and you can see here a patient with a large hole in their hip with bone exposed and microfracture being performed, and then 12 months later, there's filling in. So there's obviously some capacity to heal in some patients, but we see a rather unpredictable response to um, surgery in, in this situation. So some patients will fill this with cartilage, others won't, and will get, end up needing a hip replacement. We're trying all sorts of new technologies. We try gluing bits of cartilage back on. Not sure that's particularly effective. We try stem cell therapy and matrices. This is a picture of a matrix in the hip that, that someone has glued in and then injects a stem cell um, uh, enriched bone marrow concentrate beneath it. And there's a lot of work, uh, and we're currently running a trial on this in Oxford uh, as to see whether we can make a difference to patients with this more advanced stage disease. So is there any evidence for the surgery do? Well, in fact, it's accrued um, uh, over the past three or four years. In fact. There's good evidence now to show that about 80% of patients will get better in the short to medium term, um, particularly with, re with regard to their symptoms related to labral pathology and where they don't have arthritis at the outset. But of course, we're restricted in that we don't have good level one evidence. And the big benefit of this, this surgery is the potential to modify the progress of the disease and to prevent arthritis in the future. And we don't have evidence for that at the moment which is why in Oxford and in, in two other trials around the world are currently being conducted to, um, to look at this in great detail. So to look at the efficacy of the surgery, but also to look at its long-term effect on disease progression and the need for hip replacement. In Oxford, we're conducting this study called FATE. Um, it's a double, um, it's a, sorry, it's a parallel two-arm randomized control trial of 210 patients. Uh, we're running it in parallel with two other uh, trials internationally, and we've captured about half of all the surgery done uh, in the UK, or the surgeons in the UK that are doing this procedure. And it gives us, it's going to give us short-term measures of outcome at eight months um, and ten months, and will also give a longer-term measure outcome looking at the cartilage degradation using um, new scanning technology like T2 mapping and T1 row mapping. In fact, I was looking at your scanner here yesterday and you've already got one of those sequences installed and functioning uh, for knees on your scanner. Our provisional results suggest that in the, in the group of patients that we're selecting for surgery, which are quite broad, that the arthroscopy, seems, they seem to be responding to arthroscopy as the cohort studies suggest at the 12 month stage. So these are the initial results of about half our cohort um, uh, 12 months down the line. But the future of course is, is not necessarily what to do with these patients because we seem to be getting reasonably reliable response to surgery from that group of patients. Our issue of course is what we do with osteoarthritis because 
Um, it tends to be focal, sorry, and it tends to develop slowly. And you can see here that it, this is the stage at which we would like to treat disease with a tear in the labrum, with a, a small mobile area of cartilage that's just begin to delaminate, not the, the much later disease that we often find at surgery, despite normal looking MRI findings. And really, it's about the big focus for us as a research team has been to try and develop new surrogate measures of imaging to, to, to uh, accurately predict the amount of cartilage damage in the joint. I mean, amazingly, there's very little um, research and scanning um, uh, technology on this. Uh, certainly, there was four years ago. That has progressed quite nicely over the past two years. So what does conventional imaging do with this? Well, it's extremely useful for looking at labral tears. Uh, and uh, MRI, both non-orthographic and orthographic sequences, are very sensitive and specific for this, about 91% specific, sensitive, sorry, and 25% specific. You can even use ultrasound to, to look at um, whether someone's got a label tail, though that's less sensitive, although it's been reported to be not too bad. So it depends on the user, I suspect. You can look at articular cartilage defects as well. Um, uh, but these measures are much less sensitive and the only good one has been shown to be a, a sequence known as degeneric which is where you inject a, a rather nasty contrast agent intravenously um, and in the UK this has been uh, banned for use for joint examinations now um, and, and that gives you a highly sensitive and specific measure of, of, uh, of cartilage function and, and glycosamine or glycan contact in the cartilage. But the routine scans that are available to most of us are not very good for looking at um, cartilage damage. And this is a great example here on the, um, the right-hand side. You can see this is one of my patients who uh, came into my clinic a few months ago with a normal-looking hip. No problems on the MRI scan. She had a labral tear and what looked like ostensibly normal cartilage damage. The problem we face, of course, is that the MRI cannot pick up all the cartilage damage. And at the bottom there, that's what the femoral head of the patient looked like at the time of surgery. So a great big hole in the femoral head. So you can see that despite the best scanning technology, the current platforms that are available to us don't answer the questions we want and can't really give stage the disease correctly because we wouldn't normally want to operate on patients like this because the disease is too far gone. Or at least we would want to maybe trial a different technology such as ACI, such as stem cells. So what have we been doing? Well, we've set up a whole research team in Oxford to, to try and advance this technology, and we've seen the major target for advances uh, m based around MRI. One of the key things that we've done, and, and, uh, and certainly we've, we've already talked to Paul about setting these sequences up on your scanner here, is to, to do what we call volumetric morphological assessment. And if you acquire the scans in a certain way, it means you can section them in, in different ways. And, and uh, in any plane, really, without re losing resolution. And this is an example. This is a child that we scanned as part of one of our studies. And you can see that normal MRI scan would give you a low-resolution view in all planes. This one, because it's acquired volumetrically and it's quite an easy change to make on the scanner, um, actually gives you no out-of-plane loss of resolution. And you can measure morphology very accurately. And you can see this child has a small bump on the front of the hip that actually would not have been spotted on a normal scanning sequence. We're looking into dynamic assessment, and a lot of uh, the condition that we're talking about is entirely mechanical and dynamic. And so, as a result, it's bizarre that we should start taking scans of patients in static positions that they don't normally get pain in, such as lying flat. Uh, and we can now take a CT scan or an MRI and articulate that in a, in a computer modeled environment to predict which bits of bone are impinging on other bits. And so this is a system that you can send your CTs or MRIs to the Netherlands to, and they will reconstruct the hip in, um, in 3D in different positions. If you say I've got a hurdler, you, they'll put it in a hurdling position. If you say I've got a, a, a hundred, you know, 100 meter sprinter, they'll, they'll mod, mo model it going off the starting block. And so they'll do any, any, any kind of sport that you need for that particular reconstruction. And they'll tell you which bits of bone need to be removed and where the impact impingement is occurring. Because bizarrely, some people will impinge around the back here, as others, most, will impinge around the front. And it depends on your sport. Kickboxers will tend to impinge around the back and the side, whereas um, rowers will be impinging around the front. That said, this model makes a lot of assumptions. And 
technology is moving so rapidly at the moment, um, you can move on to different um, sequences. This is known as a, a 4D CT scan, and it's something that we've just acquired in Oxford, whereby you can, uh, an you can actively move the hip during live imaging within the CT scan. So it gives you a rather jerky image, but essentially it's acquiring a full 3D CT every, with every two or three seconds. And so you get a very good um, impression of how the hip moves in relation to the pelvis. And you can see here, compare it with the last modeled assessment, that the pelvis moves and rotates far more when the hip's flexing up. And, and so we are making some quite significant assumptions and missing quite a lot of the dynamic nature when we use computer models. So this is a further advance of scanning technology. And we found this very useful in athletes in understanding more about the pathology itself. One thing, one, uh, one, some, uh, someone mentioned to me um, what, since I've been here is the influence of the spine on the hip and the thigh and the knee position on the hip. And in fact, no one has always thought about, uh, thought about that. I mean, surgeons, as a rule, think about one joint only, particularly orthopedic surgeons. Um, now we realize that actually the back has a huge effect on the hip. And this, these are um, dynamic studies done on patients doing sitting, standing, and stepping up activities. You can modify these activities as you will. But essentially what they show is that it, there is a huge difference in terms of the pelvic tilt and the position of the hip depending on the patient's back and spinal position. And so we know that if you, particularly these are maps looking at the loading of the hip, if you change the position of the back and the pelvis, it really affects the loading of the hip joint as to where, you, where the socket, um, the, the greatest force travels through the socket. And you can see the top left here is one position of the spine and the hip. The bottom right, you can see there's a, a complete change of, of, of loading pattern. One of the mo most exciting areas, I suspect, for us uh, and, and for, uh, for, for imaging patients with early disease and specifically for sports people and tracking response over time is use of what we call quantitative imaging techniques. Now, we've mo already mentioned Degemeric, which is, a, is a, a, what we call a, a, a sort of invasive but quanti quantitative MRI technique for looking at gag in cartilage. There are new and, and very exciting um, sequences that are coming out. Some of them are CT-based, but many of them are MRI-based. These are examples of um, sodium mapping. They're not very good resolution. Here we have uh, T2 mapping um, and combination mapping on the right-hand side here, which shows in great detail the functional qualities of the cartilage. So on the left-hand side, you can see structure of the hip. On the right-hand side, you can see areas where the cartilage is damaged in the patient at the bottom, uh, and less so on the patient at the top. So this will give you very early indicators as to potentially someone's um, uh, the damage that may be accruing in someone's hip even before they begin to develop symptoms. It may be important in the future for screening athletes. So in Oxford, we've been taking this a further step and developed some other sequences. This is called chemical exchange saturation transfer. And the bottom there, this is a scan acquired at 19 Tesla uh, in, a, in a small scanner. So this is um, a small bore scanner. Um, but, so these are very much experimental sequences, but give us the potential in the future to detect very high resolution changes in, and very early changes in cartilage structure uh, and collagen 2 structure in the hip. We've recently acquired one of these. Um, this is a seven Tesla MRI scanner for clinical use. Um, uh, and uh, this we, uh, is one that was principally acquired for neuroimaging, but over the past five years, we found it much more useful for imaging of joints, bone, and muscle. And what it does is provides you with much better um, signal to noise ratios, and it provides you with much better resolution. Um, we've acquired a knee coil and have been imaging knees, and I'll show you an, uh, a knee image in a second. But this is a hip coil, which um, uh, is the only one in existence so far that we're currently um, built um, to begin trials of, of um, imaging uh, around the, the hip and the shoulder, actually. It'll fit the shoulder as well. And I suppose to finish off with, I've got an example of where imaging is going. So this is a, an example of a 7 Tesla knee image, which gives you fantastic resolution, um, both um, uh, structurally, but also gives you great physiological measures at the same time. 
And you know, most MRI scans will give you some information on the bone. You can, you can see the individual trabeculae and blood vessels within the bone here. This enables you to do virtual biopsies of bone, so you can reconstruct bone in 3D. Um, you can see also individual tendon bundles in these new scanners. Uh, this is actually the scan of um, one of my research fellow's knees. Um, the danger, of course, with these scanners is that they get so good that you're picking up abnormalities that might not be of significance. Now, he had no pain before he went into the knee scanner. Um, when we looked at his scans post-scan, he had a small crack behind his knee patella cartilage that he'd had no pain previously, but since he's been running, he's always had pain ever since. And so it would rather suggest that we have, the, although the scanning technology is great and that we have the ability to now detect very early ch disease change, the disadvantage of this is that we might be now picking up stuff that is not necessarily clinically relevant. And that's where I think the whole clinical um, package comes in, uh, working with our own colleagues in sports medicine as surgeons, but also working with allied specialities such as physiotherapy and sports therapy. I hope that wasn't too much for you, and I hope I haven't gone over time, but just to say thank you very much for inviting me. I, this slide is part of some of the people that we currently collaborate with, and I'm now very proud to, to add Aspitar to the bottom of this, um, uh, and I look forward to involving you and uh, well, particularly Paul in the Centre for Sports, Exercise and Osteoarthritis in Oxford. Thank you very much.